The last speaker is Peter Bragin, who will talk to us from Ithaca in New York State, where he is a practicing psychiatrist. And he is still seeing patients, although he is far beyond normal retirement age. And, um, well, Peter has published a good deal of books, uh, some very interesting books that have inspired me very much, like Bob Whittaker's books. And he has a weekly radio show that lasts a full hour that I was on recently. That was very nice, just to chat like that. So Peter is very active and knows a lot about psychiatric drugs, far more than most other people I have met. So I look very much forward to this lecture. So please, Peter, now it's you. I'm going to go right into um, talking about the scientific basis for what I think life is about and what I think therapy is about. If you look at our biological evolution, two or three million years ago, we started walking about on feet, on legs, hominids or early humans. From then until 10,000 years ago, which is nothing, that is for 99.9% .9 of our development, we lived in small groups. We had very, very intimate relationships. The groups are estimated to have averaged around 40 people. So we developed in large extended families and then a few other people who got involved with us as well. And this is probably true all over the world. The men hunted, the women gathered. When the men, uh, uh, when people married, they stayed in the man's family because the hunters were valued. They individual hunter apparently produced more the, to eat than an individual gatherer. So from the very beginning, we're also in couples, as best we can tell, and we're in families. Now, during this period of time, we were probably nursed for five or six years because it was nursing on demand. It was the easiest way to feed. It wasn't a lot of chopped up food in jars. So we grew up in intimate contact with our mothers and our whole extended family. It's not that it takes a village to raise a child, which is the common saying, rather it takes a, an extended family to support the mother who in the early years raises the child. This is our normal evolutionary development. You and I are the end product of a couple of million years a very intimate, highly nurtured living. The odds are overwhelming that we were more nurtured 50,000 years ago and 20,000 years ago than we are now, way more. There isn't a lot of evidence looking back for a lot of the kinds of uh, madness that we see now, which I believe are pretty much entirely from ruptured human relationships. At the same time, if we now look at the evolution of the infant in terms of this nurturing process, the human brain grows double in size the first year. We are born like the fetuses of other animals. Other animals are not born unable to walk, unable to take care of themselves, unable to do anything. We are, we are in a fetal state for months after birth. And the reason for that, I believe, is because to be who we are, our brain has to grow in response to nurturing. So just, just mull on that. We are a social brain. We are made of each other, and we evolved that way, not just in our childhood, but throughout two millions of years, building us up. The whole key to emotional stability, to emotional success, in the beginning, we can fix this as we get older, but in the beginning, the, the whole key is about those early relationships and that long history of being a social creature. Remember, we don't, have, we don't have anything that could have competed with other animals in the way of fur to protect us and keep us warm or hooves to kick with or fangs to bite with or antlers. 
we we had for those couple of million years our social relationships. That's how we could kill a mammoth. That's how the women could go out and gather in the fields and protect themselves in the fields. Social relationships. We are all about our social relationships. If we go to the most extreme uh, phenomena of disruption, we call it psychosis. What is psychosis? It isn't anything more in many ways than just the tearing apart of that fabric I've just described. That fabric built over two million years and then the early development, the brain doubling in size in the first year in response to nurturing. It's all about the rupturing of the social fabric. So the individual goes into a state which is separate from other people, which is extremely abnormal for us. The individual goes into what is essentially a nightmare, a falling apart of the social relationships, just leaving us in our raw state, which is not a very good state for us to be in. If we look at that and think more about it, the truth becomes that we heal through relationships. We heal through relationships. Now, when I work with families, I don't actually emphasize that, let's say I'm working with, with the uh, identified patient, as we say, and uh, two or three family members. I don't go back and look at what tore those things early on. That's usually, that's too horribly painful for the parents involved or the big brother who was ridiculing and maybe torturing his little sister. Instead, I look at the fact that we are made of each other and that the healing takes place through us regardless of the cause. So I don't need, I don't start out trying to make anybody feel guilty and we don't deal with those issues until people want to, which they may not want to. So we're social creatures all therapy, all help, all religion, all philosophy that's worth anything is going to be about bringing us together and helping us heal each other. I don't know, I didn't get to hear Bob talk, but we often talk about a World Health Organization study that was conducted for the purpose of demonstrating how great drugs are. That's what all the studies are for. And so they compared the third world countries, I don't remember what the, the name was at the time they were using for that, but they had two or three uh, non-industrialized nations and they had two or three uh, industrialized nations and they compared the rates of recovery from people with the diagnosis, and, and I don't believe the diagnosis is a good one, but with the diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia. And they found out that um, people did much better in the third world countries. And this disturbed them so much, they repeated the study and they found out even more so that people did better in third world countries. And the conclusion was they do better in third world countries for two reasons. One, they stop taking their psychiatric drugs right away, or very quickly, or they're not even available. And two, they have extended families, something which in certainly a country like the United States is a rarity now extended families to nurture, uh, keep company with, to be with, to rebuild trust with, to re-cement human relationships with. We have a uh, program in Finland now, which is probably the best therapy program in the world that we know of. It's documented with multiple papers called Open Dialogue in Lapland. And it simply is family therapy delivered on the spot, in the home, with open-minded, caring people. They really emphasize the open-minded, caring, the open discussions. They have a wonderful saying that schizophrenia lies in between the people. And what happens under those conditions is that almost everybody gets better and almost everybody does it without antipsychotic drugs. And they've been so successful there that uh, they have an 85% complete recovery rate, low 80s, I think, complete recovery rate. 
return to employment or school. Disability roles are disappearing in Lapland while they're increasing in the rest of Finland and the rest of the world. So the answer to doing therapy is relationship. Now I do individual therapy, but whenever possible, I do couples or therapy. I never treat children as if they are sick. I never do anything but emphasize it's up to us as adults to change ourselves to help the child. Now, again, I tell parents, look, um, many children are unusual. They're difficult. Maybe, uh, you know, I know you did real well with Janie and Johnny's a problem, but the issue isn't, uh, does that prove you're you're fine because Janie did well. The real issue is, how do we help Johnny? What do we do? How do we change ourselves? I like to call it empathic self-transformation. If you're empathic enough, you will transform yourself to reach to the people you're trying to help, whether it's your loved ones or your clients. If you can, in your private practice, dealing with the most disturbed people, have a family of goodwill, which is not always the case, unfortunately. Human beings can be very much lacking in goodwill toward their own, own children. But if you have what is in most cases the case, a family of goodwill, where there were early disturbances and maybe continuing ones in communication and love, you, you can see a young girl as I have done, who is a psychotic at the end of the school year and returns entirely normal in the fall because her parents have found new ways to relate, support, and love the person. And I think we really, in this context, we really, really need to use the word love. I think there is absolutely no way around it. I think that when we talk about communication, it's meaningless. What kind of communication do we mean? We mean loving communication. We mean communication that says, I treasure you, I value you, I care about you. And if you're a member of my family, I will turn myself inside out empathically to embrace you. And that is practically the sum of the wisdom of my lifetime. And my goal at Harvard was, was to you know, teach at Harvard someday. But in my freshman year, a friend asked me to come out to the local state mental hospital. And when I got there, it reminded me in every way to my Uncle Dutch's description of liberating a Nazi extermination camp. The people were kept in corridors. They were freezing in the winter. They were overwhelmingly stuffy and hot in the summer. They were constantly being abused by the AIDS. Even the Nazis didn't think of lobotomy on uh, people in the extermination camps, although they did experiment with shock treatment. They called it experimenting. They had good doctors there, right? And I can't tell you why. I, don't, I didn't come from a very loving background. My, par my parents had their own wounds. But it was really clear to me that uh, there, but for the grace of God, I could have gone that there was no essential difference between me and the college student I saw uh, crumpled up with feces around him in the corner of the ward. And the more I talked with people, eventually I came to lead this program. It was a lot of was written about us. We became a model program just before the collapse of everything good in psychiatry in America. Because at this time in psychiatry, see, since psychiatry is not a science, um, it doesn't necessarily move forward. It's more like politics or religion. It can drastically go backward, depending on circumstances and times. It doesn't have a scientific base. It's got a mythological base about biochemical imbalances and brain defects. And back then, by the way, now I'm talking about 1954. I'm going to be 80 at my next birthday. So we're talking about 1954, the, the theory then was bad brain cells. Does that sound stupid to you? It's, it sounded stupid to me because I was a college freshman. I hadn't gone through years of training to accept authoritarian stupid remarks. 
but it's the exact equivalent of the biochemical imbalance, killing bad brain cells. I asked the doctor, how, do you, how does the shock treatment know where to find the bad ones? <laughs> of course, he, he couldn't answer me. And what makes you think there are bad brain cells? And he couldn't answer me. At one point, I went to the superintendent of the hospital and I said, there's a, 11 of us. This is written up in the opening of Toxic Psychiatry. Um, by the way, most of you, if you've read anything of mine, have read Toxic Psychiatry, but I've written 15 more books than that. And I think my work's being left, left behind. <laughs> but um, I told them we had 11 students and we had a social worker to supervise us. We wanted our own patients. We had transformed the violent women's ward painted it, cleaned it up, made it look like a college dorm, you know, with all the kind of things we liked as college students, Gauguin, Matisse, it's probably the same thing in Europe and, you know, all, all those, uh, those painters. And um, we got the doors unlocked. I had keys, I would unlock the doors. We, the doors were finally left open. I got keys from the nursing station. After a while, they thought I was supposed to have them. And um, we were fought by the American Psychoanalytic Association's local group, the most powerful one in the country, the Boston Psychoanalytic. They said we'd ruin the patients. I'd never seen a psychoanalyst in there, and how are we going to ruin patients more than a lobotomy? Well, it turned out we got uh, eight of the patients out of the hospital. And we all had different methods. Some, thought, some of us thought we were junior psychoanalysts. I actually took a much more social approach to the, to the person I was working with. I took him for walks, I talked to him. And uh, in a one to two year follow up, most of our patients stayed out. We ended up with more than 50% of the patients staying out of the hospital. Some went home, we worked with their families and all we had was supervision of one wonderful social worker. I believe we could uh, deliver therapy to people very inexpensively if we just gave up the whole system of training and we focused on what people really need to begin with, which is a kind person, an experienced human being, somebody who doesn't take out his problems on other people, somebody who understands boundaries, probably somebody who's raised three children successfully that a person like that could be trained to do therapy, if we select it on that basis of who you are rather than your background, a person like that could probably be trained in six months or a year without ever even having to know how to read by being supervised and role-playing therapy. We used to role-play as college students back in 54, we were very inventive. We would role-play how to relate to people in my entire experience of four years in that state mental hospital, I was never hit, never threatened, and I went freely on the violent wards because people saw me as somebody to be trusted. Psychosis, most human suffering, is a failure of trust in other human beings, usually caused by one or another deprivation, neglect, or abuse. And I think we could train people to be therapists, and we'd have to recognize it's not about technique, it's not about uh, cognitive this or whatever, or moving your eyes in a funny way while you remember your, your, your uh, painful memories. It's about human beings and making relationships as a starting point. Uh, I think the most important thing for a therapist is to treasure the human being who walks into the room with them, to view them as a sacred trust, to think as much of them as of oneself, and to give them the first relationship they've ever had with someone genuinely cared about their interests more than their own. In when we love, you know, we actually do care more about the other human being than ourselves. Parents, loved ones readily give up their lives, the lives of their loved ones. We literally care more about the other. Well, in therapy, we can do that because it's very protected. We can actually be there, set aside our own craziness and our own issues and build a relationship. I'm very fond of saying I can't be crazy because I have to sit with people and pay attention to them and there's no way to be crazy if you're paying attention to another human being. 
if you're caring about and loving another human being. I believe that life can be broken down to things that simple. And recovering from from all these disorders is a matter of learning to love maybe for the first time or maybe again. And the love can be for a couple, it can be for children, it can be for animals. A lot of people love animals in ways they wouldn't dare with people. It could be for nature, it could be for creativity. But through all of my years, I've come to the conclusion that professional success, financial reward, gives a man maybe or a woman security and satisfaction, but not happiness. There's no reason to believe that the head of a big corporation or the leader of a church or anybody else who has a lot of prestige and feels successful is happy. They may feel satisfied and proud. Happiness, I believe, comes through love for each other. And in my practice, I have found that the moment a person decides to become a source of love, the moment they get that straight, and they decide, I have that in me, I can love. They start finding people to love them back within 30 days because there are other hungry people walking around who want to have loving relationships. And in, in my therapy, that's what I teach people. If somebody comes in and they're angry and they tell me my waiting room is too small or I charge too much money or whatever, I explain to them that I can't be the caring and useful person I want if, if they're gonna make me uneasy. And then to, this only happens very rarely because most time people walk in the office, they look around, they get relaxed right away. I wish I could show you the, the office. But uh, when that happens, I say, no, 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 you're not here to express all your emotions. I said, I'll bet you do that all the time at home. That's part of the reasons you're here. You're here to learn to communicate in a loving way with other human beings. That's what I'm going to help you learn to do. You're going to get the love, the security, and all the things you're missing in your life because basically we all yearn for that. That's how we're made. We're made to want to love and be loved. That is not unique to us. My dog has a lot of those qualities, but it is by far and away compared to other creatures are characteristic. Now, I also do other things in therapy. Sure, I talk to people about how they became injured as children. We look back in to childhood, but I always recast it in how it harmed your ability to love life, love other people, connect and bring out what you have to give to the universe and to the world. So I'm going to take another breath there and ask Peter what he'd like me to do. Is this interesting? Um, Peter, can you hear me? Yes, it's just oh, a beautiful connection. I wonderful. can see the room. I'm in church with you, folks. Wonderful. You just heard my wonderful. sermon. Wonderful. Um, Peter, one of the things that impressed me so much about you, and I have, I now know other psychiatrists like you, who have had a great career, some without using psychiatric drugs at all, and others using them extremely rarely. For example, you once told me that you might use a benzodiazepine if a child had problems sleeping after the mother or father died for a very short period of time. But I have now met psychiatrists from several countries, including an Irishman who became advisor to the government and was incredibly much respected in Ireland. He never used psychiatric drugs. He never used electroshock. Right. He didn't. So there are these places in the world where they don't use forced treatment. There are psychiatrists who have done very, very well, practically without ever using psychiatric drugs. What you didn't tell the audience was that these people with schizophrenia that you encountered, these were considered the worst of all people with schizophrenia yeah, in the world. Hopeless. And everybody had given up on them. 
And here you come in with your fellow students and you're human and it works. So I think this illustrates so beautifully what psychiatry should be about. And this is why I wanted you to talk to us, Peter. I really, I just don't start people on psychiatric drugs and I haven't since I went into practice in 1968. I don't treat people with psychiatric drugs. The other thing is, is I never lock up anybody involuntarily, ever. Not since my training have I locked up anybody. Now, and I think this is a blessing and a good fortune because any therapist can have suicides or homicides in his practice, but in all these years now, I've never had a suicide. And I've never had a serious violent outburst on one of my patients. And I think it's because since I don't drug people, I have to give them my cell phone, I have to be available, I have to care about them, I have to think a lot about them, I have to involve other family members if things get desperate. It's kind of like if you have a conflict with somebody and you have a gun, the conflict's just going to get resolved in one way. But if you're unarmed, if you don't have drugs, you can't lock up anybody. They could be in the room for five minutes and I can tell they're hallucinating. And I, I'll just say, I want you to know right away, um, I never give psychiatric drugs. And whatever you tell me, I'm not gonna raise the drugs you're on because I don't raise the drugs people are on. I'm, I wanna help you come off and I'll never lock you up. Now I'll have to report you if I think you're gonna kill somebody, but I think we can work it out before it goes that far. And the relief that comes over people in the first 10 minutes, you can actually see somebody who's hallucinating stop hallucinating because they're trusting you for 10 minutes, literally. And then I might say, you know, I don't think you've been hallucinating for the last 10 minutes. And then they'll get really frightened because then the voices come at them and say, don't you talk to him? Because the voices are always the abuse, almost always the abusers from the past warning them not to connect to anybody else. So it's not like I've cured the person, but I've shown them in the first session that actually the voices go away when they connect, when they dare trust, and then the voices come back and slam them because that's the nature of abusers. You make a step forward, they try to destroy you. They don't want you being free. And I'm talking about really severe abuse cases with a lot of hallucinations. My name is Cyril Tovsen. I'm, I'm active in a patient's organization, which is called Aurora, and I'm from Norway. So I, I, I know that your ne the next phase you will talk about um, drugs and the impairment of the brain. So my question or my solution is, uh, or my suggestion about drugs. Uh, I, I think that we should, in all countries that, uh, that, are, that are active in this field, we should go to the politicians. And we should crave that everyone, every doctor who should be able to prescribe drugs, they should have a certificate that shows that they have intensely and long studies of the drugs. That will, that will leave out the general practitioner and it will always also leave out the psychiatrist. So why can't we crave a certificate for a prescription of drugs? In my country, the certificates are always in order to have even more power than you had the day before. They are never a learning experience. They're always a trade union experience. Um, I think we'd be better off just stopping them from drugging people. And uh, I think it's gonna have to be like the Berlin Wall where people just stop participating, that at some point there'll be a wave as people see the damage to their loved ones and to the culture. Um, I have a more practical and radical approach myself. I, in a recent journal, you can get this right off my website, it's right at the top of bregan.com. It's like number six in a little list. New article I have out in the European Journal, Childhood and Society. I think we should get together and start with asking for a complete ban on giving psychoactive substances to children. Period. 
I don't think we should fool around with certifying or you got to have more knowledge. In, in a debate with a pediatrician, he thought he really had me because he said, well, I only, I only give uh, drugs to three out of a hundred of my patients. And I said, doc, I wouldn't know which three to poison. Um, I, I think we have to get tough. We have to say that starting with our children, no drugs. We can't have this gorgeous brain growing, this product of multiple m millions. I mean, it's really hundreds of millions of years before we get to the mammals and then to us and the evolution of this brain, whether or not you think God participated in any way, your brain is the most complex thing in the whole universe. Each of our individual brains is harder to understand than the entire cosmos because life is so much more complicated than the material universe. We have to stop poisoning this incredible organ, at least with our unwitting, helpless children. I think that's a good place to start. For many reasons now, going to a psychiatrist, probably the most dangerous thing you can do in the Western world, other, other than, you know, do something illegal. Maybe remember, I invited you to Denmark some 25 years ago, Peter Bregin. My name is Carl. Uh, Hi. Yeah, that was, I think, in uh, 89 when you traveled in Scandinavia. Yes, uh, I went to Norway too. And Sweden yeah, you went to Sweden and Norway yeah. also. Yes, you brought your <clears throat> son with you. But I, I always admired you to speak up loud about the brain disabling uh, epidemic caused by uh, psychiatric drugs and electroshock. And you have done incredible things all these years. What I want to ask you is, did it, did it work? Do you think, did we influence the public? Did we influence uh, the real world? Did things change to the better or to the worse? And how, 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 what's, what's your evaluation about the coming years? Will we succeed to end this epidemic within our lifetime or something like that? That's a great way for me to start the second part. When I first started talking about issues like this, I, I conducted an international campaign to stop psychosurgery. And then I went on to take on shock treatment and the antipsychotic drugs. When I started, times were extremely different. My life was repeatedly threatened. I had bodyguards. I had the FBI come in to investigate threats. When I would go on television, I would be uh, ambushed. I'd end up with uh, four people attacking me. Um, audiences were very threatening. A psychiatrist was slandering and libeling me in the press. I sued one of the more big ones, Leo Alexander in Boston, and he settled for a lot of money. Then they stopped slandering me and libeling me. Times have vastly changed since then. There are many, many people, first of all, doing wonderful work. Peter, Goethe, Robert Whitaker, many, many people, Matthew Downing. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin talking about all the people in the audience. And the attitude of the public has hugely changed. In the United States, I get standing ovations instead of having to uh, have a bodyguard. Now, that doesn't mean the profession has changed at all. And again, I think if you look at it in terms of, say, the Soviet Union or slavery in the US, as public opinion turns against the Politburo or against the slaveholders, they get tougher. They get more slaves. They get more oppressive. So psychiatry is probably the worst I've ever seen it. The most stupid, the most ignorant, the most totally at odds with Western civilization and all that's uh, good in humanity completely opposed to freedom, autonomy, love, spirituality. Psychiatry is the worst it's been. It's very much like the psychiatry that, that uh, 
that took o- that took over in Germany when Hitler came. The psychiatrists loved Hitler. No more psychiatrists joined Hitler percentage wise than any other group, and that's another story I could come back and tell you. I've lectured on that in Germany, actually. So psychiatry is worse than ever. They'll start doing a lot of lobotomies again if we don't speak up. Shock treatment's rampant. But the public is so much more aware. Everywhere I go, people thank me. Everywhere I go, people tell me horror stories. It doesn't matter whether it's a man repairing a roof of my house or if it's a waitress in a restaurant. People have gotten the idea, at least in the U.S., that this system isn't working. But more and more people are in the system, ironically, because psychiatry has revved up and gotten worse. The drug companies are pouring more money into advertising. So you have two separate camps evolving now. The people who are against this whole system, or at least very suspicious of it, and the system. And both, I think, are increasing We will never change the system. You don't make the Politburo into nice people. You don't make slaveholders into freedom lovers. You have to do something to stop them. I think the most obvious way it's gonna stop is people stop going. Like the song about war. What if nobody went? But I also think we need to be very active in other ways I'm very active in the legal system. I do a great deal of legal work that draws attention to what they're doing, that punishes them for what they're doing, but the the goal is just to do honorable legal work. So that's my answer to that question. It's a kind of complicated one. I want to get a little more systematic now and cover some things about my theory about psychopharmacology. All of this is in my books. It's in my big book, the medical book, Brain Disabling Treatments in Psychiatry, with thousands of references at the end. And it's also in my latest book, Summarized, in the first half of um, Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. The most important principle to understand about psychiatric drugs is not very complicated, but I, I see hardly anyone except Joanna Moncrief in Great Britain, the psychiatrist, they are building on this principle, yet it's the most fundamental principle. And that is that psychiatric drugs only can work by disabling the brain. There are no psychoactive substances that improve your marvelous brain, period. Not nicotine, not even caffeine, certainly not marijuana, or street drugs, and even more than any other drugs, the psychiatric drugs, because they're tailored to get across the blood-brain barrier and do as much damage as possible. They're tailored to do that. So what does it mean when a psychiatric drug works? Well, it means it's disabled the person's brain. It might be your own brain. Let's say you have a few drinks to fall asleep at night. I don't begrudge you that as long as you know what you're doing, but you're doing it by disabling your brain. And it's no different if you take some benzos to go to sleep at night. They affect very similar neurotransmitter systems. So that's the basic most important principle about psychopharmacology. And I hope all of you will begin to use it more when you write and think and talk. As a part of that, a corollary to that, is that no drugs improve brain function. So all the psychoactive substance disrupted and no drugs improve it. Now, why does, why does a disability get to be seen as an improvement? I'm gonna go through the various classes of drugs and talk to you about that. But first I wanna cover two other principles that will go into your understanding. One principle is what I call medication spellbinding. When I write about it in scientific articles or in my books, all my articles are on my website for free. When I write about it, I call it intoxication and nosognosia, not knowing you're intoxicated. 
when we take a psychoactive substance, we lose our capacity to judge its effect on us. Any of you who have ever been at a party where everybody but you is smoking marijuana, you'll find that the profound statements being made are absolutely silly and the cookies don't taste all that good. It's all the misleading effects of the drug. The person who thinks that the life of the party on alcohol may be ruining their business and social relationships. Alcoholics commonly drive cars believing that the drug really doesn't impair them. It's the same with psychiatric drugs. I often will see a couple and let's say the husband will say, I've been doing better since I've been on antidepressants the last couple of years. And I'll notice there's a little flatness in, in what he's saying, doesn't have that sparkle of the human treasure there. And maybe his wife will say, well, you know, honey, I know that you've, you seem to feel you're better, but we haven't made love in two years. And, and you, don't, you don't even play with the dog anymore. The man, meanwhile, all he knows is that he's had some relief of pain through the anesthesia. Really, it becomes apathy and indifference often long term from, from the antidepressants. But the person doesn't know it. I had a man come to me on antidepressants who I took a detailed history from. He'd only been on for two months. I told him that, well, one of the things we'd work on was his having a life because he didn't have any life. He didn't go out, he didn't socialize and so on and so forth. He'd only been on a month or two and we just took him right off. He came back a week later and described a very active life he had. He hadn't even thought about having an, his active life on the drug. He couldn't even remember the friends he played cards with. Not that his memory was gone, his engagement was so gone with life, he couldn't describe the fact that he actually had quite a, an involved social life, even though he was single. The way the antidepressants, and I'm gonna try to go drug class by drug class, the way the antidepressants affect people is kind of complicated, but one of the first things that happens is that people sometimes get a little high. I'll read a medical report and it will say, the patient came in after a week on the drug or six weeks on the drug and says he's never felt better. And the doctor puts exclamation points, bang, bang, bang. Well, that's a terrible sign. That's not a wonderful sign. What does it mean if you're on a drug and you've never felt better in your life? It means you're euphoric. It means you have brain injury that is giving you an unrealistic appraisal of the life that you have been leading, which has been making you miserable. It's not a good sign. The shock doctors do the same thing. The patient uh, gets a euphoric and the doctor writes in the chart, mood improved instead of symptoms of brain damage showing through. Now with, with, with the um, antidepressants that sometimes the euphoria will lead to mania, then you got a real problem. And more often it just goes away. And people go from one antidepressant to another trying, without even knowing it, to try to get that brief euphoria. Then what gradually happens on the antidepressants, and I'm sure I'm addressing some people in this room, and I want to be as thoughtful about this as I can, is that without knowing it, you start to lose the edge. That, that spiritual connectivity. And you might just think about whether you do your artwork that you loved as much before or your music, or if your relationship to God or Jesus, whatever your view is, was as spiritual, or whether you really had the same amount of enjoyment from your children now as you did, if you like taking walks with your dog as much as you used to because the eventual effect of the antidepressants in my experience, and I, I think this is a fact, is it wears down connectivity that 
very special highest quality. In the long run, people can't get off the antidepressants. In the US, we have an estimated 20% or more of women on antidepressants. I think it's mostly because they can't get off. And when they try to get off, they have such terrible dysphoria, pain, suffering, physical, neurological problems that they, they think they're mentally ill, terribly mentally ill. The doctor says, yeah, you need more of the drug. And you go back on the drug and the anesthesia returns. Now, many of you are gonna be functioning really, really well on, on some of those antidepressants. But I believe if you carefully and thoughtfully come off, you'll discover that there's more to you than you realized. Because the generalized disruption of neurotransmitter systems does not leave us at our very, very best with our best potential for creativity and happiness. Long term, every class of psychiatric drug, we have evidence not just for biochemical imbalances that remain. But by the way, there are no biochemical imbalances in your brain before you start taking the drugs. Then you get multiple ones, not just one like Eli Lilly might claim for Prozac. You get multiple imbalances. But in all the groups of drugs, long term, there is visible brain damage on MRIs for many people. Let me look to talk to you about the stimulants. In um, 1990 something or other, 98 maybe, because of one of my books, the, the, the leading office in our health agency in the US told their major conference on ADHD and its treatment that they had to have me there because they didn't have this, had this huge conference that was gonna be the conference to talk about ADHD and its treatment, and they didn't have anybody talking about adverse drug effects. I mean, that's the way the establishment is. So I got to go there, and the, uh, the guy from NIMH, he didn't want me there. This came right out of the Office of Health and Human Services, the top office that had me come in. His name was Peter Jensen. His name still is Peter Jensen. I said to Peter, I'm not just going to talk about the adverse effects of the drugs. I'm going to talk about the, the animal model, which tells us how the drugs work. And the greatest expert in the world, supposedly on the subject, Peter Jensen, said there is no such research. Well, there are innumerable articles on animal research. If you take a chimpanzee, this is how we get the brain. I'm going to looking at how each of these drugs disables the brain, how it shows clinically. They all ultimately are disrupting neurotransmitters. Probably because of effects quite deep in the place called the uh, basal ganglia, as well as in the frontal lobes. If you give it a chimpanzee, which is like a normal child, chimps like to play, run, jump, escape. They don't want to be in cages. They touch each other. They're very loving. They're quite social. They're high up on this evolutionary process of being very social. If you give them a classic stimulant, methylphenidate, amphetamine, methamphetamine, they lose spontaneity across the whole spectrum of their behaviors. It crushes spontaneity. So in a chimp, what you see is there's less escape behavior there's less exploratory behavior, there's less socializing, smiling, less hugging, less kissing and less touching, less grooming. And that behavior is replaced with robotic obsessive compulsive behavior, such as chewing on bars, playing with pebbles or pacing. We are making our children into good caged animals when we give them a stimulant drug. We're crushing their spontaneity, and we're, through the basal ganglia, enforcing obsessive compulsive disorder. There was a study done at NIH of their own um, elementary school there, where all the kids are on drugs. It's the only study that actually looked at OCD as an adverse effect. They found that half the children had obvious clinical OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, from the drugs. And of course, since they were, quote, doing better, they'd all lost their spontaneity too. 
That's the sadness of Western education. In the U.S., teachers always rate children improve when they lose their spontaneity on the drugs. So it's very, very clear how the drug works. In this case, it's not for the child at all. Of course, the diagnosis doesn't even include ADHD, anything like child suffering, child unhappy, child anxious, child depressed. No, no, it's child doing things that annoy teachers. That's how this was evolved. It's just a list of things, talks out of turn, squirms in seat, things that annoy teachers. Well, you can flatten all that. He won't throw spitballs at little Janie anymore. Janie won't send a note to her girlfriend. This is a crime. This is not a mistake. This is a consciously developed crime. There are no studies that show that stimulant drugs help anything. All the studies show is that for a few weeks you can suppress behavior until the brain fights back. We've got the massive MTA study that was a criminal attempt to try to show the drugs worked and they couldn't even do it. They couldn't even do it with millions of dollars invested. The drugs don't work. They don't improve any quality of the child's life. And they cause horrendous problems from from permanent tics to heart disease, to stunted growth, to psychosis. When, when Adderall XR, I don't know if you have the equivalent of that, that's the amphetamine mixture that's long acting, when it got approved in the US, and we lead the way for all of you, they studied it for three weeks. Our FDA approved it on the basis of a three-week study. Why did they only go three weeks? Because they don't work. Don't you think they'd love a six-month study to brag about and take the market away from everybody else? Instead, they do a three-week study so they can avoid showing the drug doesn't even suppress behavior, but it ends up causing disturbances after a few weeks. Children universally don't like the drug, but children universally, even when they're angry and mean, want the approval of adults. So when they see that the adults like their behavior better, the children say that they want to take the drug sometimes, they'll say that. But they don't tell you that they like the drug if you interview them. Parents are simply bamboozled. This child abuse is not because of the parents, it's because of the drug companies and the prescribers and anybody else who stands by and watches. We now have studies that, and I, met, I give the sites briefly in um, psychiatric drug withdrawal, following the first children in America from the 1970s, boys whose teachers thought they were mildly hyperactive and whose parents thought they were fine. And they get started in a free clinic, makes it a federal crime, on Ritalin, now, 40 years later, they have very statistically significant increases in every bad outcome you can measure. Suicide, crime, mental hospitalization, imprisonment, drug addiction, depression, suicide, and on, on brain scan, they have atrophy. Now, the people who do the study say this shows you that having some hyperactivity is a disaster. That's how sick they are. Now, what caused this? Not, not, not a few years of Ritalin. That, that can do a lot of damage, but not that kind of damage. What happened to these people is they became lifelong career mental patients, a lot of them. Because the drug robbed them of their autonomy and their spontaneity, made them think they were mentally ill, made them think they needed drugs gave them adverse effects that were then treated with more drugs. Some of the, many of these patients, unlike the controls, were so fat they couldn't even get in the scanner. That means they were on the newer antipsychotic drugs. Horrible outcomes, horrible outcomes for these children. I really hope some of you will get really active on calling for a ban. The antipsychotic drugs are very easy to understand their brain disabling effects. They cause a chemical lobotomy. 
All of them suppress dopamine. All of them do it fairly intensely with the possible exception of clozaril, which is so poisonous it's been banned in many European countries before we approved it. They block a dop dopamine D2, which is the primary nerve trunk from deep in the brain to the basal ganglia to the frontal lobes. When somebody tells you that schizophrenics have too much dopamine because the drugs work and are blocking dopamine, they're very stupid or very psychopathic. It's a horrendous experience. Most people hate it. But remember, many people are self-hating or they're just overwhelmed with their suffering and they may say it's better. They don't know that there are better ways than being chemically lobotomized. The data on these drugs causing shrinkage of the brain is overwhelming. The CPN in Great Britain recently tried to get their society that's the Critical Psychiatry Network. I'm a member of that. Um, tried to get the, this is their, their or whatever their society is to, to have at least a seminar in their big conference on brain damage from these drugs, and they couldn't, despite the fact they have multiple psychiatrists who wanted it. The mood stabilizers, just to, using lithium as an example, it is so toxic that when it was used in salt shakers in the 20s, it killed people. It was discovered when a man named Cade, C-A-D-E, injected guinea pigs with the drug. He was actually, he was a psychiatrist, but he was studying renal functions. He injected guinea pigs with the drug and they became flaccid. So he thought, this is fabulous. He literally walked across the street from his lab and started giving it to mental patients in Australia. And it made everybody flaccid. Then the National Institute of Mental Health promoted it as a magic bullet. No, it's one of the most disruptive drugs there are. The other mood stabilizers, most of them are anti-seizure drugs. They're basically sedating people and suppressing brain function. That's all my colleagues know how to do is suppress, suppress, suppress. Damage, damage, damage. Whether it's drugs, ECT or psychosurgery, disabling the brain, destroying brain has been a part of our history. We used to openly acknowledge it. We used to be able to read in textbooks about all the damage until I started quoting it in public books. And they stopped. I've actually changed the whole way they write. Finally, the benzos, they're very easy. The benzodiazepines are anesthetics. If you give enough of them to a person, you could do major surgery on them. When you feel less anxiety on a benzo, it isn't because your anxiety has been suppressed. It's because all your higher function has been suppressed. Anxiety is the existentialists have tried to teach us. I don't actually believe in them anymore, but oh, they're wonderful for when you're young. My anxiety is not about my family and my fears of how to live. It's about some abstraction. It's not, it's about our social relationships. Anxiety is a very higher function, so it's one of the very first things to be flattened by the benzos. Um, that pretty much covers the drugs. The benzos are horribly addictive. All the drugs have withdrawal reactions, every drug, because the brain fights every drug. The brain doesn't say, whoopee, my dopamine is suppressed. It tries to get dopamine hyperactive which produces tardive dyskinesia and severe withdrawal reactions, both psychological and emotional. The benzos is like withdrawing from alcohol. You go into the DTs. Withdrawal from the stimulants, you crash into depression. One way to think about what does a drug do on withdrawal is to think of what would the opposite of the drug effect be because the brain's trying to do the opposite. So if the drug jacks you up like a stimulant, and like many of the antidepressants are very stimulating on some level, you may not even feel it, but they are jacking things up. So when you come off stimulants and antidepressants, the most likely thing that's gonna happen to you that's very dangerous is suicidality and horrendous depression. And because of medication spellbinding, you need to tell your patients this every day, because of medication spellbinding, they won't think, oh, I'm depressed because of the drug. They won't even think it even though you told them. They will be spellbound and think that life sucks and they should die. 
So you have to just keep in touch with people when they're coming off meds. They need to have a, a whole support network. If you can get one going with them, they need at least one person talking to them a few times a day. If you're doing serious drug withdrawal, that is people who've been on for months and months or on multiple drugs. So withdrawal, expect the opposite effect, but don't be certain because you never know. I tell people, if you get any weird feeling, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a, a ache in your big toe and you think it's gout. You get any odd feeling during withdrawal, call me. Because it might be drug withdrawal. Because you've disrupted multiple neurotransmitter systems. You can't just block serotonin reuptake, you know, the famous SSRI model, because when you block serotonin, other nerves start working overtime to compensate, the whole brain gradually goes out of whack. And eventually you're not even reducing serotonin in the brain because the brain's jacking up its serotonin production. So you got all these compensatory mechanisms and they lead to serious withdrawal. There are very good studies that actually show that your odds on having a manic attack when coming off lithium are greatly increased during the withdrawal period. So you get manic withdrawal from lithium. Then the doctor says, oh, you've got bipolar disorder. But you might say, but doc, it's 20 years, you know, and I've hardly ever had a bipolar in my life. And now I start lithium and I come off it and I've got another attack two weeks or a week later. But you know, patients, even when I'm a patient, I don't have the wherewithal to make these clever observations with the doctor, you tend to give up authority in the presence of the doctor. A main point about psychiatric drug withdrawal as an outpatient, and that's what I'm talking about, is you go at the patient's pace, not yours. You go as slow as possible. And I describe in the book, there's many ways to go as slow as possible. Most of the antidepressants, for example, come, come in fluid form, eyedroppers. You know why they did that? So you can give them to infants. They don't do things for good reasons. They do things for marketing reasons. Actions. I could probably stop there. Go ahead. Oh, oh, oh you could hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. because we only have uh, 10 more minutes. I, I would like to ask you about two things, Peter. Uh, one of the things you write in your books, which I find incredibly important, is if you get a patient that has taken marijuana or LSD or heroin and that patient is psychotic, then you don't say you have schizophrenia. But if you have a patient who is on a psychiatric drug that develops a psychosis, then you say, oh, now you also have a psychosis. So I need to add an antipsychotic drug. So this, this you have alerted people to. It should be forbidden to come up with new psychiatric diagnosis when you already get a drug, because it could be a side effect to that drug. I mean, there are people here who would like to ask you, I have asked my doctor to have this drug withdrawn, and my doctor says I should just go on. But what does a patient do in that situation? In our country, what I recommend is you get a therapist to help you with the suffering that you go through doing withdrawal and maybe a GP, a general practitioner, because your psychiatrist won't, to uh, help you uh, slowly withdraw from the meds and give them my book to read. By the way, it is so common now. I, I just saw a patient who was, the parents decided to bring her to me instead of right into a mental hospital because she had become schizophrenic and was hallucinating. And what were her hallucinations? Well, since starting on an antidepressant, she was seeing bugs on the wall. Well, in the old days, we knew in the 1960s that if a patient was seeing little tiny things, they had an organic psychosis caused by drugs. We knew that. Everybody knew that. The DTs, you see little bugs running around. And nobody had suggested to her that this so-called psychosis or schizophrenia which is not a term I believe, by the way, uh, that, uh, that this was um, causing the bugs on the wall. It's very bad out there, folks. The psychiatrists are the most ignorant people on the face of the earth now. There's two reasons, three, five, probably 10 reasons why psychiatrists are so ignorant. One, they do horrible things to people and can't bear to look. 
Two, the people going into psychiatry now are not like we used to be, you know, neurotics who had some therapy and we liked it, so we became a psychiatrist. They're now withdrawn human beings who find a way in medical school that they can have power in relationships and drug and shock and lock people up. So they're, they're not nice people, they're not empathic people. And another thing is that if you actually begin to look at people as objects, and you start saying things like you can't talk to schizophrenia, you treat people as objects, you become destructive to them. It is very hard to be, quote, objective about a human being. It tends to bring out the destructiveness in us. So for many reasons now, going to a psychiatrist, probably the most dangerous thing you can do in the Western world, other, other than, you know, do something illegal. Um. And unfortunately, I, it's also your GP now, so it's really gotten bad. Your general practitioner, everybody's given the drugs out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions, Go ahead. questions for Peter Bregin? I'm uh, Julius Nissen. I don't know if you happen to know uh, Elena Sjor. He wrote a book called Love and Forgiveness. Very good book. It's some good. of the themes you are into. I just want to tell you we are, I think, sadly, only two. Danish psychiatrist here today. We uh, both, on a free basis, help people out of their medications. Uh, we both got expelled from, from uh, the Danish psychiatry. And I would also like to tell you that we have early experience in Denmark, also in the community psychiatry, where we didn't give that many drugs simply because the patient wouldn't take them. The wisdom I am sharing with you today is very old wisdom. I'm just applying it in a new setting. It's all, it's all pretty much what every wise person has concluded, that we need to love one another and need to heal one another. Um, I think that's, that's the, the main thing I, I would say in response to that. Thank you, sir, um, for, uh, for your insights. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist, and I would just like to ask you, the services that you provide in the U.S., uh, uh, these valuable services, uh, speaking from the point of view of the, of the way uh, you finance uh, services of this kind in the U.S., uh, is this uh, form of treatment uh, intervention available to everyone? And uh, would you say in a country like Denmark, where it's the public purse that pays for these services, that there are psychiatrists enough to provide these services, uh, assuming that they are much more time consuming than the bad services that are provided now? It's a lie that, that giving drugs is cheap. I mean, it produces vast amounts of hospitalization, disability, violence, suicide. That's number one. Number two, Stop thinking psychiatrists. They're not going to be able to deliver decent services ever. They have wedded themselves to the drug companies. You have to start thinking, what alternative services do we have? What can we develop? What are the modes of training people? I'd rather you had a model like um, the ministers in the US. Almost anybody can get licensed as a minister and have a church. I'd rather see that model then let people go to a therapist who claims they trained with so-and-so or go, you know, it's not gonna come through the state and through licensing. That's not what states do. It's gonna have to be grassroots, people developing much more inexpensive ways of doing therapy. If we opened up to a whole variety of kinds of people doing therapy, therapy would be cheap and plentiful. In fact, in America, psychiatry is vastly declining because uh, Students don't want to go into this awful profession. They see it, and they, the only ones who want to go in are these withdrawn, unable to relate to people who want to manipulate and control. Your ordinary doc, you didn't want to go into anything as crazy as this. So we're, psychiatry is going, becoming less and less, but then the drugs are being given by more and more different kinds of doctors. Think outside this box. It's, the answer is not inside psychiatry. Psychiatry has always been an oppressive model that's been going on since it began in the state mental hospitals. The whole history of psychiatry is rooted in the state mental hospitals. The main difference now is that what we used to just do to people in state mental hospitals, psychiatry gets to do to everybody. You've got more kids on drugs 
in school than we used to have in our children's units. Oh, there is someone from Danish national television. We just have one national television. So I will give him uh, the last word. As I understand, uh, psychiatric drugs is a relatively new invention. As I understand it, it originates from the United States in the 1950s. Before then, you were either uh, received a lobotomy or you were castrated, but you were not perceived uh, sick or otherwise needing treatment. So what, bother, or what interests me is that during the 1950s, something must have changed since we could go from being just uh, being uh, perceived as mad to going to be a patient and become ill. Uh, psychiatrists have been poisoning people for 200 years with drugs. We, we used to give people arsenic and any poison we could think of, we've given to patients. We've given them things to make them vomit, have diarrhea, have convulsions. So we've been poisoning people from the beginning. And if you go back to England, where they had moral, moral therapies for a while, where Took, who was a Quaker, had a, had a, a facility that was based on love, caring, and spirituality, and they, they took the most difficult patients and they, they, they helped them and they left. He even then was saying, and, and they, were, they were 18th century and 19th century, he was saying, we have to keep the docs out because they want to poison the patients. So that's been going on forever. However, the question is very, very good. I think that the first turning point was Valium because it provided a drug that in one dose could make you feel better, just like alcohol without the stigma. And so instead of, and it was directed at housewives and advertised to housewives, it was called Mother's Little Helper. And a lot of women were told this was not addictive like phenobarbital, it's actually more addictive than phenobarbital. Um, and millions of women in particular got hooked on these drugs. That was the beginning. And that didn't turn out so well. The next big breakthrough was when psychiatry began to lose all of its patients to women therapists. For a long time, psychiatry um, had the power to say through the insurance companies, if you're going to go to a psychologist or a counselor or a social worker, you must also see us and be supervised. The insurance companies gave that up in the 60s. And then you had this burgeoning in the U.S. of family therapists and counselors, marriage and family counselors, women who were much better at helping women, who were most of the patients, than men. It wasn't like going to the office and you saw somebody as remote as your husband and only worse. Now you could go in and talk to a woman who didn't have all the pretenses and the drugs. And so psychiatrist offices started to become empty. The American Psychiatric Association was losing membership because doctors didn't even have enough money to be members, psychiatrists. So, and I've tra traced this in toxic psychiatry from the minutes of the American Psychiatric Association. They literally got together and said, we have to change the whole model. All illnesses are medical. All illnesses might want drugs. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna go into partnerships with the drug companies. Well, the drug companies leap with joy and promptly took over psychiatry and medicine. And starting in the 60s and 70s, American medicine, first mostly with psychiatry, but now all aspects were taken over by the drug companies and the issue became marketing. Market to adults, you run out of that. Market to children in the US, you run out of that. We'll go to Germany and Australia and England, run out of, saturate them. Well, we'll go after the Danes and the Norwegians and the Swedes, all marketing. I think that's a brief history. Does that make sense to you? Thanks okay. a lot. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I, so, thank you again, Peter. We will draw to a closure now. Okay? Thank you a lot. Thank you. I'll bleep out. Give us the
Thank you so much, Peter, that after all these technical difficulties, we got a chance of listening to you. I had a great time. So um, thank you so much for contributing, and thank you to everybody that you came today.